we're going to be talking about dopamine today. And this is a really interesting subject um, for us as clinicians, because we're working with people um, and talking to them a lot of times about diet and lifestyle changes. And often we're looking at motivation factors for people and things that get them really excited about making these changes that can help their, their health and their wellness. And ultimately, dopamine has a very important place in that. So I'm Dr. Molly Force, I'm the clinical director here at Prosper Natural Health, and I'm joined by Dr. Rosalie Elambert, who's here with me today. And we're going to be um, talking about dopamine, of course, and we just want to remind you all that we're naturopathic physicians, which means that we really like to look at the whole picture when we're working with our patients. We're trained as primary care doctors. So we work with old folks and young folks and everyone in between. And um, when we're thinking about how the physiology works for people, we want to remember that when we change one component for someone, it's going to affect and have a ripple effect in other areas of their body. So as we are um, going through this, we do these uh, monthly talks, these doc talks, and they're free recordings, and you can find them afterwards on our website. So make sure to check out some of the older recordings. There's a lot of really good information on there. We've got stuff talking about bone health and hormones and mood and energy and B12 and all kinds of cool ones. So we've cataloged and archived those for patients to check out as well as community members. So feel free to do that. This is our way to kind of share information and talk about kind of the coolest new research and helping people understand some of the, um, the topics that are coming up in clinic for us. So today's talk on dopamine is going to hopefully encompass for you guys what we mean by the dopamine hit, what dopamine is, how we can support our body with dopamine, what's considered a more healthy versus unhealthy way of getting dopamine for the body. We're gonna talk about dopamine's role regarding Parkinson's disease as well. Um, and we're also gonna be talking about how dopamine can impact some mental health disorders because dopamine has a very um, profound impact on the body. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter. And what that means is it's a signaling agent for the body and it's communicating in the nervous system, specifically this reward pathway. And this is the, horm the neurotransmitter or the signal in the body that gives us pleasure and satisfaction and very importantly, motivation. So when we have patients who come to us talking about the lack of motivation to get going on things, a lot of times we're starting to think, oh, what's going on with their, their dopamine system? Now, this also involves movement. And this, this we'll talk about how this is involved in Parkinson's disease with this, but dopamine impacts movement greatly. It also has a very profound impact on our sleep wake regulation and attention. So all of these are very much um, impacted by dopamine. And you can kind of see this on this little chart. It's like, okay, we're expecting to get our caffeine or our, or our coffee in the morning. And as we're brewing it and smelling it, and then, you know, adding the the pleasure of a cream and then sugar to it, we're all doing things here that are providing our body with more of this dopamine, more of this satisfaction. So what's interesting about dopamine is that it's not so much um, a, a bad neurotransmitter when we have it, even in ex in high amounts, it's really a learn a learning neurotransmitter, if that makes sense. So it's not telling us if something is bad or good for us. It's telling us about 
uh, our experience with it. Like, did were we satisfied by that? And so it helps us learn and is very important for our survival because we get these rewards when we're completing tasks that are needed for survival. So this is this is why we've created this uh, neurotransmitter is that it helps reinforce those things that keep us alive, like eating food, drinking, um, you know, beverages, staying hydrated, socializing and even reproduction. So our bodies truly are hardwired to seek pleasure and to make sure that we are getting what we're needing, these base survival requirements. And so truly this is an essential neurotransmitter when it comes to the learning pathway. So it also is very related with anticipation. And we're going to talk about this here in a second, but this anticipation of a reward coming. And we kind of joke about dopamine being involved in kind of like the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. These things that um, can get a little bit wild, but provide pleasure and some dysregulation that can come with excessive seeking of that. Um, And we're going to get into all of that today. Thanks, Dr. Molly. So ultimately, what causes dopamine levels to rise? And like Dr. Molly was mentioning, it's just activities that that are uh, pleasurable. So that can be smelling or eating tasty food or drink. So if someone's cooking muffins in the in the oven, then like your dopamine is starting to rise at that point. Exercise also builds dopamine, especially if it's uh, if you get to the point where you're also getting the endorphins and, you know, all the wonders of of exercising for a more prolonged amount of time. Sex, of course, and intimacy in general, physical touch, whether it's uh, intimate touch or hugs or just petting a dog or a cat um, accolades and accomplishments, right? Things that make you feel good to be part of, part of society. Um, and then exercise on here again. Yeah, that's an important one. (laughs) Uh, additionally, watching TV, uh, which is something that ends up being, you know, when in, when in excess can be habit forming. Um, same thing with shopping, same thing with social media, especially when you see that that button, that red button by by your application that says, OK, I've got a notification that p- puts out dopamine and then some risky behaviors, including things like skydiving or winning or gambling um, that will also put out put out dopamine. So. You know, as humans, we seek this out um, and then there ends up, you know, in society being uh, having uh, created drugs that also cause a dopamine flood. And some of these drugs are 10 times more of a dopamine surge than any old regular uh, uh, um, activity that would that that um, would be pleasurable. So. Those sorts of drugs are things like opioids, uh, cocaine, and nicotine, even and alcohol, all affect the dopamine system in the in the central nervous system in the brain. So here's a little research on the role of anticipation in our dopamine pathways, since. Interestingly enough, most of the dopamine actually gets created in anticipating the said pleasurable event as compared to kind of experiencing that acutely or in the moment. So dopamine levels rise dramatically in humans when we anticipate potential rewards that are certain and even far off. So for example, if you think about retiring with, you know, your life's work of of wealth and relaxing that can also uh, pump out dopamine, surprisingly enough. And this is pretty unique to humans, um, which is just uh, we'll talk about humans versus animal models later. But this is a really interesting piece that's just purely uh, purely ours as the human organism. Um, so when you think next about, you know, your cup of coffee in the morning, uh, so much of the 
enjoyment of that is actually in the ritual, in the steps that are taken before that really enjoyable uh, morning beverage. So maybe you've heard of this concept known as the dopamine hit. It's sort of, uh, you know, became popular in the internet age, especially in the social media age where things are so accessible online per a screen uh, and that humans can get these dopamine hits by, you know, just a click of a button ultimately. So it's a feeling or enjoyment of enjoyment that you get in anticipation of and after a pleasant experience. Um, like Dr. Molly said, it's not necessarily bad or good. Again, the reward piece here contributes to your motivation to learn. You're going to keep doing that behavior because it feels good. So repeatedly, these dopamine hits can be habit forming. And that's where, well, that's where it becomes a bit of a problem, where we talk about dopamine either in excess or in uh, and the receptors in excess or in um deficit can can be uh, an issue. So habit forming pleasurable activities, whether it's eating uh, or binging on junk food, whether it's social media of all varieties, whether it's video games, whether it's pornography or gambling or alcohol or recreational drugs, you can see that all these things, perhaps in one, you know, on occasion, it would be totally fine, right? But when it becomes habit forming, that's when we start to think about the dopamine neurotransmitter and, and what has happened in the brain. Now, Dopamine is active mainly in the brain, and that is kept um, separated by the blood-brain barrier from our, uh, our uh, peripheral tissues. But we also have a cardiovascular and a um, kidney involvement in the peripheral tissues that use these that use dopamine. But when we're thinking about dopamine, especially in the brain, because that's where the majority of it has action on our nervous system, when we think about what happens for when we lose our ability to produce the actual signaling agent of dopamine, we get this disease process, which is Parkinson's disease. And so in that process, the substantia nigra, which is producing these dopamine producing neurons gets attacked and starts to degenerate. And so we lose this ability to create dopamine. So this creates the perfect model essentially for what happens when we don't have adequate dopamine. And some of the most obvious symptoms are on that physical uh, level with mobility. We see a slowing down for these people, slowing of speech, as well as a tremoring that can happen and rigidity in movement. There's also a lot of times this loss of sense of smell and a slowing of the bowel. So we get this constipation. It's actually one of the first signs that we see when we, when we have Parkinson's disease initiating. Sometimes we see as pa with patients, we see lack of arm swing as well. And that plays into this idea of this rigidity and this um, decreased movement, smooth, smooth movement um, piece that happens. So the treatment of Parkinson's from the conventional model is providing this form of a medication that prevents dopamine breakdown. So it preserves the, the dopamine that is still there so that the dopamine can have effect at that neural synapse. So that area where the neuron gets the signal of the dopamine, it helps flood those receptors with more dopamine and keep that active. So the other thing that can happen is we can have a reduction of the ability for the dopamine receptor sites themselves to respond. And these, once again, are really, will really widely affect the um, body because they're expressed both in that central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous systems. And we see from the medical literature that a decrease of thyroid, for example, if our thyroid hormones 
aren't in a normal level and they're too low, we have a decrease of dopamine activity. So we also know that if dopamine is repeatedly released, so <clears throat> for example, in habitual drinking like alcohol or in say like cocaine use, that kind of thing, over a period of time, the dopamine recept receptors themselves downregulate. The body says, oh, we we're always flooded with this dopamine, <clears throat> excuse me, so we don't need as much of these receptors to be there, to be stimulated every time we see a little bit of dopamine. So that's what happens when we get tolerance. We become very tolerant to things in that kind of scenario, like dr a drug or alcohol, for example. And so the more that that drug or alcohol or <clears throat> pleasure pathway that's creating the dopamine um, is coming in, the the more those receptor sites down regulate and that can make it harder because more of that um, agent that provides the dopamine is seeked usually to get that pleasure response and so we can see a whole bunch of disorders that can show up from this within that addiction sphere so when we think about addictions dopamine really needs to be considered so that can be everything from the the drugs um, you know, gambling, sex, different games, shopping um, disorders, food, even <clears throat> even things like hoarding and stuff like that. So here's the research ultimately on what Dr. Molly was was talking about is just, you know, when these dopamine receptors, are continually flooded with dopamine, the body is smart and it down regulates those receptors. So less are made, which means that ultimately the amount of dopamine in the brain is binding less receptors. So you're getting a less, less of a, um, an input to, you know, the pleasure centers of the, of the body. Um, so you know, what's interesting here is especially this last line that says uh, habitual intake of addictive drugs uh, reveal that dopamine receptors in the brain are decreased, thereby reducing interest in activities not already stamped in by habitual rewards. So this is just a really interesting just yeah, it's just interesting to dive into the primary literature that just confirms ultimately how what happens in the brain with addiction of all sorts. Um, there's all sorts of different different addictions, but ultimately what's required is that there's a brain chemistry change. The dopamine receptors downregulate, and ultimately a tolerance is created. So more of the event or uh or intake needs to happen in order to get the same amount of pleasure. Here's another research, art, research article on marijuana specifically and its effect on dopamine receptors. Um, and this one was from about 10 years ago here, 2014, that, that shows that ultimately there's a decreased dopamine activity in the brain for uh, marijuana abusers, ultimately, um, which means that when there's less dopamine, uh, there's less reward sensitivity and lower motivation and increased stress and increased irritability, right? So I had to dig into this article a little bit to see sort of what was defined by a marijuana abuser. Um, and ultimately, marijuana abuse per this study was folks who are using at least more than um, four times a week and more than about four joints a day, which is a, a good amount of, of, this, um, of this herb. And also in this uh, article, the marijuana abusers were had at least 10 years of experience with marijuana specifically. So it's just, you know, this is this is the thing with these research articles. It's just defining how they how they came up with their hypothesis. Um, but what's what is really curious to me is indeed, you know, habit forming behaviors are diminishing uh, dopamine receptors and thus the behaviors downstream 
things like irritability, low motivation end up happening. Yeah, and we have to take this into consideration, you know, the it being an older study with some of the older language around it, but it is a really interesting thing that anytime we have um, excessive exposure to certain dopamine building pathways, we will often have that down regulation um, for that specific uh, pathway providing the dopamine. So as far as a disordered eating, this is another whole realm of the dopamine uh, pathway and regulation that is just so fascinating. And this was a study that basically just was talking about specifically binge eating and how dopamine is very much part of that food craving. It is involved in the decision making and then that execution of that eating behavior and how um, dopamine is is regulating a lot of that that impulsivity around that. So when we're thinking about addressing some of these behavioral models that can be very challenging, looking at what's going on within that dopamine realm is just once again, so very important. So, and we see this also in the literature with bulimia and anorexia. So it goes beyond um, just like binge eating or even overeating. So, and then here's an interesting study that, that we pulled um, that was on high fat diets. And once again, you know, this is a, a pleasure reward system that's trying to help keep us alive. So we like being able to have these high calorically dense foods being available so that, that we don't starve um, as humans. But here we can see that when we have a high fat diet, and this is in a mouse model, so it's not perfect because remember we have slightly different um, dopamine signaling pathways than our um, mammal, my, our other mammal friends as, as um, within the primate and um, human realm. But even here we see that when we have this high fat diet that's consistent, it begins to in really reduce the dopamine reuptake. Um, and that happens through this connection with insulin. So our blood sugar regulating uh, insulin receptors actually also have this communication with dopamine. And in that last slide, I want to say when Dr. Rosalie and I were picking this, um, we just wanted to say we don't want to shame high fat diet choices or having fat in your diet, there's healthy fats. But this is just another way that the body is seeing these, these pleasure reward pathways and learning from them, and how that can be affected. So, you know, we talked, we sort of led this talk by by discussing, well, what can go wrong with, you know, the dopamine levels themselves and the dopamine receptors and them down regulating. But, you know, part of this conversation also includes just the really wonderful things of, you know, what contributes to human pleasure. And there's a multitude of, quote, healthy ways to increase your dopamine levels. Um, and this is a conversation that I have in depth with my patients who are experiencing depression or low motivation or quickly quick to, to irritability um, is just how do we, or even uh, alcohol abuse, for example, how do we reframe and sort of rewire the, the dopamine pathways to increase those levels through other behaviors? So this is just a nice little chart that describes some of the you know, favorite activities. Um, and we'll dive into some of the research here, but consuming probiotics, curiously enough, uh, can boost our dopamine levels, eating more protein, uh, getting good sleep, uh, avoiding high fat diets, like Dr. Ma Molly just mentioned, um, exercising regularly. And again, this is just thinking about it again, from the habit forming perspective, how are you going to form your exercise habit? Um, that's going to boost your dopamine. Um, meditation, of course, meditation is just, it's just kind of the 
the root root of it all. Um, listening to music and different music activate different people in different ways, um, whether it's uh, classical music or like electronic dance music, right? You can sort of pick your favorite here, but certain certain uh, certain music uh, can can really, really support to um, the dopamine pathways. Spending time in the sun, of course, uh, by the beach, even better, uh, is going to be supportive of dopamine. And then following a healthy diet. And I think that has to, do, oh, that goes hand in hand with avoiding um, sort of a high fat, like high junk food diet. Um, and so we'll dive into some of the research here next. So here's an article from 2021 on dopamine and exercise specifically, showing that the relationship between uh, of, between both of these is observable through all uh, across a variety of exercises, whether it's um, you know a simple five minutes of um, something really fast, or it's 60 minutes of a slow run. So dopamine ends up being pumped out in both of these scenarios. Um, and what was interesting about this article is very much that is just, you know, it addressed the question of how much, how much is necessary for a good amount of dopamine to be released. And the answer is, it depends on the patient, right? You would know only yourself after an exercise, um, a bout of exercise, whether you're feeling those that flood of just pleasure from from dopamine, um, or whether you need to push it a little bit harder. Um, so, so a big plug for exercise, especially habitual exercise. And then here's our research on meditation. Um, and meditation actually upregulates both brain neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine. And we'll have a doc talk next year on serotonin. Um, but this is just a really, really excellent practice. Again, try to get it into a place where it's you formed a habit with it. Um, in that the 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 science is just mind boggling to me looking at these numbers here. Um, the, the complaints here, they were looking at de depression and anxiety and that just meditation itself improved uh, depression by 42% and anxiety by 35%. That's just, you know, mind boggling numbers to me. Um, and then same with, with people who are noticing um that they had physical disorders, whether it was physical pain or um or other kind of diagnosed conditions, is just an improvement in those by 35%. So again, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to do with amount of time, it just has to do with whether you're able to form a meditative practice um, and include it with within your week. So, and dif different patients will benefit from whittling around their or rescheduling their time so that they can fit in meditation. But what I've found to really work for a lot of people is just coming up with a very specific schedule and sticking to it. So maybe that's within the first five minutes of waking where you're laying in bed and specifically meditating. Meditation doesn't necessarily require a certain fancy pillow or certain position, even for your body. There are so many different ways to engage in meditation practices. So think about providing yourself with that little gift of that time to start engaging in that practice. If you haven't, it is very life-changing in my experience. So my favorite topic here as a microbiologist is this uh, dopamine and probiotics piece. So this is really cool. They have an entire group of probiotics that they have now labeled as physiobiotics, which are sorry, psychobiotics, which is so cool because it means that it affects how the brain works. And so these are probiotics that 
impact mental health. And they have these interactions with our commensal gut bacteria and can affect how our neurotransmitters work. And we know from this, this is just uh, a nice little study that kind of put together the different groupings and they talk about these different neurotransmitters. And like Dr. Rosalie said, we're going to talk about serotonin and probably GABA as well next, next year here um, in this, the coming few months. But each of these have deep impact depending on what's going on with gut flora. So if we have a patient who's coming in and once again, they have low motivation or they're dealing with irritability or they're having even more dysfunction in the dopamine realm with either addictions or trying to get a handle on um, a movement disorder or Parkinson's or something like that, then we are often thinking about what's going on with the gut microbiome in particular since that's where the majority of our probiotics live and supporting um, a rebalancing of that. And there's some really amazing PCR stool tests that can help us really identify what's going on for your microflora. With uh, supplements that we use in our clinical practice, we always like to just mention certain ones that we find to be helpful. This is one that has some really cool research behind it. This is actually the same product put out by two different labels. And essentially these are human specific uh, flora that are really designed to be chosen for the strand uh, for ones that affect the neurochemistry. And so these are, you'll recognize like the lactose. Um, the lactobacillus acidophilus, for example, and the bifidobacterium here, like you probably have heard those names, but these are very specific strains of, of those subtypes within those that are supposed to be helpful according to the medical literature with rebalancing um, the neurologic um, components. So that's pretty neat. And then we also like this type of product because it has this l ramness and in it and what that does is it can help with reducing what we call exotoxins from foods so these are foods that can come in and cause brain reactivity maybe in a way that we don't want um, because the way those proteins will mimic certain proteins that the brain would normally be um you know, taking for with a, a different signaling direction. So that can be a really helpful tool, but ultimately choosing a probiotic is a very individualized process and one that should really be taken in consideration with your healthcare practitioner and determining what you really need, looking at your own microbiome and what's going on for you, especially if you've had testing or something like that done. Thanks, Dr. Molly. So here's an interesting research article on dopamine and omega-3 specifically. Again, in a mice model, so we've got to just think, think about our brains versus theirs uh, and, and take this with a grain of salt. But ultimately, omega-3s, you know, they're touted for diminishing inflammation, for uh, you know, supporting both the nervous system and also um body pain and the musculoskeletal system. So this, this article was looking at um, whether omega-3s were effective in uh, the brain release of dopamine. And so this study, actually, um, the, the scientists took the mice and gave them seven days of fish oil or olive oil. And then they looked at their brains uh, under, you know, whether you know, these mice were alive or not, I'm not sure, but they, they looked at their brains pretty ex extensively and uh, saw that the, the mice who had uh, had the fish oil actually showed a greater level of dopamine and it's specifically the dopamine metabolites, which means there was more dopamine upstream, uh, which they corroborated to mean that ultimately Omega-3s can be helpful in restoring dopamine neurotransmission uh, in the brain, and this is specifically thinking about uh, TBIs or traumatic brain injuries. So after a traumatic brain injury, there's a whole bunch of neuroinflammation, you know, and the 
the synapses or the neurons that are talking to each other in the brain have a harder time to talk to each other through all of this inflammation. So um, this is a pretty promising study, and I'll be curious to see if they do have any human uh, or primate-specific follow-ups uh, given um, just this, uh, yeah, given given the results that they found over just seven days of, of fish oil. And so we've got uh, we've got fish oil here at Prosper, and if you've listened to some of our other doc talks. These guys come back uh, in, in a lot of them, just uh, especially from that angle of them being so anti-inflammatory. Um, and of course, you know, dietary fish oil is our uh, fish is our best way of getting getting these uh, omega threes, but supplemental forms are really helpful in very specific. Um, uh, diseases or symptoms. So DHA is one of these omega-3s. Uh, DHA is ultimately brain supportive. It's brain fuel. It's also brain anti-inflammatory. Um, so when I think about my patients who are suffering from brain fog or even low dopamine symptoms, uh, I, I reach for my heavy DHA uh, omega-3 combo. EPA is more of our anti-inflammatory omega-3. So this, you know, my patients who have musculoskeletal pain, joint pain, uh, chronic neck pain, this is where I reach for a more EPA heavy uh, uh, fish oil combo. And of course, we do have some vegan omega-3s, and these come also from the marine world, but they're algae specifically in lieu of of a uh, fish source. Um, and the D EPA DHA ratio ends up being more like a one to four uh, combination. So our algae, our omega-3s from the vegan world are actually quite brain supportive um, at the end of the day, which is pretty, pretty amazing um, to learn. I always like thinking about how the fish are getting their essential fatty acids, their omegas, often from the the krill, and the krill is getting it from algae. So it's all it's all full circle here. So we also wanted to make sure that we mentioned some direct supportives for building dopamine in the nutraceutical world. This, um, for folks that really like to see the science behind it, you can see at the bottom here, this neurotransmitter biosynthesis is looking at how do you build dopamine? So dopamine is being produced in the body with the start of an amino acid. We see tyrosine here. Now, tyrosine needs to be able to pass through the blood brain barrier if it's something that we're supplementing with. And so that's why whenever as clinicians, we're thinking about giving tyrosine for dopamine production, we're always getting this in acetyl L carnitine, uh, tyrosine form so that it can cross through. Now, it is a precursor to L-DOPA and L-DOPA is going to decarboxylate into dopamine and that the L-DOPA itself can cross through the um, blood brain barrier. So these are two specific um, products that we are often recommending patients depending on what's going on with their dopamine levels to support them. And what you'll see in here is they have these precursor amino acids like the tyrosine in them, and then usually a muconopurine. And this is a really interesting herb that has naturally occurring L-DOPA in it. And that L-DOPA is that, what, that last stage before the neurotransmitter dopamine itself is made. And to do that, there's a requirement of um, a cofactor, which is B6, or also known as P5P, which is the form of B6 that's required. And so when that happens, the dopamine itself um, is created. And then with these um, supplements, the um, this Designs for Health product, for example, the Dopa Boost has also in it quercetin, which has been studied to be helpful synergistically for L-Dopa um, production, as well as it has a, an extract of green tea as well, which also has some cool literature on that for L-Dopa. So um, these are just options that we will use 
for some folks to really help with that dopamine production if we're concerned about the actual production or availability of dopamine for their system. So we're gonna take questions here in a minute, but we wanted to just also invite you guys all to our talk that's gonna be on January 11th. It's gonna be uh, all about doing a cleanse, a detox um, within the new year. It's a great time to kind of reset, especially after all the holiday celebration. So make sure you mark that on your calendar and you'll get little email reminders to sign up about that. And of course, if you or somebody that you are um, you know, really caring about is experiencing any kind of dopamine disturbance or dysregulation, give us a call. We can get you um, an individualized treatment plan to kind of help, help out with that and re-regulate that. So we wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for questions today. So if anyone has questions, this is a great time to put them in the chat. And I'll bring that up. We've got a question already. Um, oh, what great. does it mean uh, when serum dopamine is high, particularly in absence of any apparent addiction? Is this transient and temporary throughout the day or are serum levels fairly, fairly constant? Um, and my understanding is that dopamine varies widely uh, throughout the day uh, th from person to person, from whether from blood to urine, um, and that on, honestly, the the half life of dopamine is about two minutes, uh, especially for someone who has normal kidney function. Uh, so, all you know, what I I end up um, I end up being a little bit wary of tests that look at the neurotransmitters um, because it's just such a momentary snapshot of, of that moment. And it doesn't end up telling us what, yeah, what 24 hours looks like or what uh, seven days worth of the neuro neurotransmitters in the body uh, actually are doing. So hopefully this, this addresses the question. Maybe Dr. Molly has some, some additional thoughts here. Yeah, I really agree with what you said, Dr. Rosalie. And my concern when we're looking at um, dopamine on these tests, like if we're doing a urine uh, neurotransmitter or a serum neurotransmitter level is we're not really seeing what's in the brain. So remember that blood brain barrier really makes it hard for us to check these um, dopamine levels. And in my opinion, have them be accurate. So they're looking at a peripheral amount, what's available for our peripheral tissues, which that's important, but it, it only tells a portion of, of the picture. So I don't get too worked up when I see neurotransmitter testing, um, although some patients really find it helpful to look at those levels I don't see them to be necessarily clinically accurate when we're looking at what's going on in the medical literature. Unfortunately, it'd be so nice to have an easy test for that. That being said, I do think that if somebody is having excess dopamine, we have to go back to what we were talking about with those receptor sites becoming flooded and then those receptor sites starting to downregulate. So Remember dopamine, we, we want adequate dopamine stores. Um, we want to be, you know, feeling satiated and, and happy and um, excited and motivated uh, for life. So that that's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily concerning those higher levels unless what it would be showing is that the receptor sites themselves are going to be down regulating because there's so much dopamine flooded. So let's see if we've got more questions. Looks mm -hmm. like we've got one just saying, um, love to know more about probiotics and supplements for Parkinson's. Yeah. So Parkinson's is, um, a 
big, uh, it's, a, it's a huge topic. And I know we just, you know, kind of did a little intro to it. With Parkinson's, there's so many different what we consider foundationals that we feel like as um, more functional medicine, naturopathic providers that we want to make sure we are checking off for these patients. So we've got everything from making sure that they've got the proper building blocks for their brain neurochemistry involving making sure they have glucose stability so and good oxygenation and um, so the fuel that they need for the brain and those those essential fatty acids for the brain and then also we usually have specific recommendations that we have for them for stimulating dopamine that are almost like um physical therapy style supportives, but that are for the neurochemistry. So that might even involve things like smelling certain smells um, to support the olfactory senses. Um, it can be really a broad, a broad range. And then with probiotics and it, specifically now for things like Parkinson's, there is some cool literature that we came across when we were doing prep for this talk that um, is more specific to that. And it kind of gets in, it's neat because it gets into some of the microbes that we see being maybe not so good when they're overgrown, those opportunistic bacteria that can be problematic, and then um, some that can be more helpful. The, the um, nice thing is now we do have access to PCR testing for the microbiome. So that really has transformed, I'd say the last 10 years of my clinical practice has been really transformed by being able to get that information for people and to know what their dominant bacteria is. I will also say there's so much coming out in the medical literature right now about probiotics and the testing is still limited to, you know, a certain up to about 75 to 100 different microbes. So we can't see them all quite yet, um, but that is something I'm, I'm looking forward to in, in my clinical practice, being able to see more of that. Do you have anything else you want to add to that, Dr. Rosalie? Yeah, I think, you know, that what you mentioned about um, about treating the gut <laughs> is huge here in terms of, of figuring out what is the microbiome? What's the dominant microbiome? Does it involve uh, one of the one of the microbes that's associated with Parkinson's, which is desulfovibrio? Uh, and does it involve uh, high bacillus species, which are which are associated with with uh, a, a better dopamine mm -hmm. output? Um, that's ultimately a great place to start. And then secondly is reaching for the herbal world in the herbal herbal world um, for our uh, our, our herb known as Makuna, um, which is which is in that product dopatone that that Dr. Molly mentioned earlier uh, that specifically boosts dopamine levels. Um, and it's sort of the only herb, that I've come across um, in my herbal studies that has this very specific action. Um, and so it could be used for Parkinson's patients, it could be used for uh, low, low dopamine symptoms in general. Um, but of course you'd wanna have a, have a visit with your healthcare provider um, in terms of knowing dosages and amounts and when, um, when to do all of that. This next question that we have in regards to why do healthcare providers order dopamine uh, testing and how can they use you know, that result? Um, so that kind of goes back to what Dr. Rosalie and I were trying to uh, talk about in kind of a ginger way uh, just a minute or two ago saying that, you know, for our practice, we don't prefer um, testing those levels because once again, it is such a snapshot and it's not going to tell us what's stored in brain tissue um, for really looking at accurate, in our opinion, levels of dopamine and having that be clinically relevant. We think that there may be some folks that um, do some of that neurotransmitter testing because they do want to help and um, a lab will run those levels. And so sometimes they, you know, see that and they think, oh, dopamine, I want this answer about how much dopamine there is, or if I have enough precursors on board for dopamine sort of thing. But um, ultimately, for our clinical practice and really looking at how 
the physiology works. Um, that's our job, I feel like, as clinicians to be really honest about what we think is going to be viable for the patient, actually going to be clinically accurate and, and relevant for them. So it's it's not something that we usually are, are doing. So any other questions, you guys? Thank you so much. We just love doing these for folks. It's really fun for us to to learn. It's it's a good dopamine hit for us because we get to learn. So remember that, you know, just um, learning things that, that are interesting to you, that's a dopamine hit. That's good. <laughs> so we want to engage in that, engage in the continuous learning. All right. We're going to sign off. I hope everybody has a healthy holiday. And um, we want to remind you that our clinic is closed um, that last week, this last week of December. So we'll be back on the 2nd of January, but we hope everyone stays really healthy and has a, a great, uh, great holiday. And hopefully we'll see you in January and we'll be talking about cleanses and detoxes and it should be an exciting new year.